you have your Bible, turn to the book of Genesis, chapter number 5. In Hebrew, it's Bereshith. It means in the beginning, the beginning of things, the start. Genesis chapter number 5 and verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam, in the day when they were created. Father, bless this holy book now. Thy name I pray. Amen. Don't make any difference what your, what your pop culture happens to be in 2022 here in America. It doesn't mean anything. That means nothing. When the Bible says he made them male and female, that's exactly what he did. He made them male and female. I can't help it if these poor people are so stupid today. They don't know what the difference between a man and a woman is. But I've got the Bible. I want you to notice what else it says in verse number one. In the likeness of God made he him. Now our brother Bullinger that lived back in the 1800s tells us that 14 times in the word of God we have a generation like we'll find it right here. Chapter number five. 14 times. That's two times seven. And each time the generation shows up, it pinpoints some particular thing, and it has something to say to us. It's very important. For example, this is the book, the book of the generations of Adam. And notice that the Bible says that he called their name Adam. Now, I've, we've had perverts that say that, was, that uh, you know, there's hermaphrodite or something of that nature. You've always got people who want to destroy the Bible. The reason they'd want to destroy the Bible is because the Bible convicts them once they've read it. But I have learned from experience that most of the high critics of the Bible out here, they've never read it. They don't have a clue what's in the Bible. They just heard somebody say something that somebody else said that somebody else said. But we have their name Adam. What does that mean? Adam is a generic term. Avam in Hebrew, it means mankind. Uh, is a female part of mankind? I mean, if she's not, what is she? Well, of course she is. She's mankind. In Hebrew, the word for man is ish, ish, ish bosheth, ish bosheth, and so forth and so on. The word for female or a woman is ish ah, ish ah. And so it's very clear in the Bible, you have no problem delineating between the two, ish and ish ah. Mankind call their name Adam. In other words, mankind's name is mankind. Then he called him Adam, and then Adam called her Eve. And Eve means day spring, in other words, the mother of all living. And she certainly was. She was the first mother on the face of this earth. The first one to give birth was Eve. From her, all of mankind has come forth. If you look at the, look at the book of Luke chapter number three, you'll find the genealogy that traces all the way back to God. And it says that Adam was the son of God. Now that's no uh, coincidence because we have, a, we, have a, we have a first Adam and a last Adam. First man, second man. So it's important to understand what shows up for us here in the book of Genesis because it's the beginning. One of the things that you learn in studying the Bible is the doctrine or the idea of first mention. When something is first, first mentioned in the Bible, take very special attention to see the context of it and the message of it and all of that, because that's the way the Bible's written. As I told you too, this past Sunday when I preached from the book of Hosea, I told you that Jezreel, one of the three names and three sons, two sons and daughter that, uh, that Gomer and Hosea had means to scatter Jezreel, but it also means to return and to bring back. Hebrew is a very, very uh, flexible language, if you say, and it's old language. It's the oldest, Bullinger says, and I have no reason to disagree with him. It is the oldest of all languages. It is the fountainhead of everything. It's the oldest there is, is Hebrew. So we find a generation talking about Adam. Now, Adam had a bride and he named her Eve. His bride was the mother of all living. Adam died for his bride. He made a choice to die for her, which becomes a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, Adam himself becomes a type of Christ. It's an Old Testament picture of New Testament truth. Abel lived, and he was the first one to suffer for righteousness because his brother killed him. 
This means that Abel becomes a type of Christ because he suffered at the hands of his brother Cain. And Cain therefore becomes the father of a bloodline throughout the Bible. You are of your father the devil and Cain, the apostle says in the New Testament, they go after the way of Cain, the way of Cain. And Cain was a murderer. He's the first murderer in the Bible. Seth therefore replaces Abel and his name means appointed, placed, set. If you remember Genesis chapter number three and verse 15, he said, I'll take the seed of the woman, bruise the head of the serpent. Seed of the woman and bruise the head of the serpent. They call that the proto-evangelism, if you get off into you know, Bible, Bible colleges and theology. In plain words, it simply means it's, it's the first mention of a redeemer, of the salvation that comes from the redeemer. This is the seed of the woman. And you and I both know tonight, since we have microscopes and we have, we have, uh, we have uh, technical ability to understand that a woman does not have seed, but the man has the seed. So therefore, for them to say that back here in the book of Genesis is quite a remarkable thing, don't you think? But the seed's important because we'll begin to trace this seed right here. We'll start tracing it with Seth. She says, he's the appointed one. He's been placed. He's been set. Enoch is in this, this genealogy in the book of Genesis before the flood, and his name means uh, teaching. And he is a type of Christ. Enoch is a type of Christ because all of a sudden he disappears and his body's gone. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ was gone for he, after 40 days, ascended into heaven and his body went with him. Seth, I mean, Enoch walked with God and so did the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one Enoch in the whole Bible. And he is so special that there is a book called the book of Enoch. And some of the churches have accepted it as canonical and some have not. A lot of people today that teach prophecy, especially as it relates to the second coming of Christ, the Nephilim and all of that, refer a lot to the book of Enoch. And they refer to the Apocrypha and some of the writings of Josephus and others to support that doctrine. I believe that you can use Enoch, but you can only use it as far as it agrees with scripture. The Bible is the absolute authority. If it deviates from the word of God, so much with it, it's out the door. It's not scripture, it's not canonical. Then we have Noah, and we're beginning to learn something now. Noah is also a type of Christ because he is the savior of the world. Had it not been for Noah, not a single soul would have survived that flood, but eight souls did. So therefore, the first time the number eight shows up in your Bible, it's the number of new beginnings, new beginnings from the old world into the new. The name Noah means rest. And here's a prophecy as it relates to this. Genesis chapter number five and verse number 29, when he named him Noah, and he called his name Noah, saying, this same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. Enoch therefore, Noah therefore, becomes a type of Christ because he literally, re he redeems them from the curse. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth all the days of your life. Curse was placed before the flood ever came. But God used Noah to bring rest. In the book of Genesis chapter number eight and verse number four, as a matter of fact, rest is associated with Noah in more than one place. The Bible says, and the ark rested in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. In this is the rest that comes with Noah. Things are resting around him. For example, in Genesis chapter number eight and verse number nine, but the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot and she returned and, and she returned and returned for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto, unto him into the ark. That's quite a thing, don't you think? Rest. In plain words, there is no rest except it's associated with Noah. No rest, no rest to be found. And that's exactly what we find. Look at Genesis chapter number one and verse number 31. Here's quite a remarkable thing now, if you'll hold on with me. Genesis chapter one, verse number 31. Look at this. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Notice the completion of the day, evening and morning. Now look at chapter number two and verse one. Thus the heavens and the earth 
were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he'd made. And he rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he'd made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. What's missing here? There's something missing. There's something here that's different from the one before. For six days God worked, and then the morning and the evening made up that day. But if you notice on this seventh day, there is no evening. No evening is mentioned. In other words, it goes on into eternity. There is a rest in God that can only be found in God. And there's no end to that rest. There's no morning and evening for another day to follow. This is as far as it goes. And the rest is in God. Aren't you glad for that? I certainly am. If you look over here in the book of Hebrews, chapter number four and verse number eight, it says this. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Now hold on a minute. Who are we talking about here? In Hebrews chapter number four and verse number eight. Hold your place there and look at Acts chapter seven and verse 45. And we'll see a wonderful truth. Acts chapter seven and verse number 45. And you've got your place in Hebrews. We'll go back to that in a moment. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 45. Which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles. Whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. Who are we talking about here? In the book of Acts 7 45. Who? Joshua. No question about that. This is a historical reference to Joshua. Yet he's called Jesus. And why is he called Jesus? By the writers said this, Jesus. That's the word in Greek. It's not Yahushua, it's Jesus. Jesus in Greek is Jesus. Okay? So why does he use this in Acts 7, 45? Because Joshua is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now go back to Hebrews 4, 8. If Jesus had given them rest, now wait a minute, look at this. If this is our Lord Jesus Christ and he's not capable of giving you rest, see what's going on here? We have Joshua again being called Jesus. And the writer of Hebrews says, If Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Here's the point. When Joshua brought them into the land, he led them, and he was a type of Christ. He led them against their enemies. The enemies were eventually driven out. You know that they didn't do everything the way they should have. <clears throat> but we do know this. We do know that there never was a complete rest for the children of Israel. Why? Well, they had civil war among themselves and they had to fight their enemies off. You see? But the argument here in Hebrews chapter number four, the writer of Hebrews is making an argument. And that argument is this, that in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have rest from your enemies. You have rest from your possessions. You have rest from your battles. And your rest is in God. And the only place you'll ever find rest is in God. He said, this, this rest that he's talking about is a gift of God. When we come into him and we trust him with the salvation of our souls. There's a lot of people tonight that say, oh yes, preacher, I believe that, I believe that. But you don't really believe it. Because you believe that you've got to do something to stay saved. They believe, they, they believe that you've got to do something to add to your righteousness. They believe that your righteousness is something you've done. Your righteousness is nothing that you've done. He is made unto us righteousness. He is my righteousness tonight. What in the world, who am I to think that any goodness or any, 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 any obedience on my part could be compared with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But my, what a fool I'd be. He is the only sinless, perfect one. Therefore, I find rest in him. Although I know that I am not perfect, I still know I'm a believer. I know I'm a believer, and I find my rest in him. Why? Because he keeps my soul. I trust him to keep my soul. That doesn't mean that I don't pray. I talk to him every day. I talk to him all day. I talk to him... In 
times you wouldn't think you'd be talking to God. I talk to him and I talk to him and I talk to him because it may not be long before I see him. Amen. I'm 20, 30, 40, 50 years older than some of you folks in here. I doubt if I'll make it to 150. What do you think? In other words, I want to be ready. I want to be ready. He's my righteousness. That's a rest. Now that's only one illustration of a rest. And he talks about a day where they have rest. What day is that? It's the Shabbat. It's the seventh day of the week. Notice, the seventh day of the week. The finishing of the week. Rest. God did not rest because he was tired. He didn't rest because there was, there was some fulfillment that he was, he, he was waiting for. He ceased to do what he was doing because it was the beginning, not the end. It was the beginning of the work of God throughout all the labors of mankind. He that worketh in you to do and to will of his good pleasure. Is God still working? Of course he is. He hasn't ceased. He hasn't ceased and until he finishes the work. Well, you mean he's working to, to, so he can become my savior? No, that was done at Calvary. One time he offered himself without, without sin, one time to the Father. Okay, so we've got Noah. And we have a beautiful thing here because the writer of Hebrews uses the word Jesus. And he had given, had he given them rest, in other words, the contingency, but he didn't. And then in Acts chapter 7, Joshua therefore for two times, twice in the Bible, is called out as a type of Christ using Jesus, his name, Jesus. And so therefore God's rest is not a rest necessitated by fatigue, nor consisting in idleness, but is that upholding and governing of which creation was the beginning. That's what Alfred said. That's good words. It's the upholding and governing of which creation was the beginning. My, my, my. Moses records the end of each day, except which one? That's the endless day. The endless day. Now we read about Melchizedek in Genesis 14, 17. The Bible says the king of Sodom went out to meet him after the return from the slaughter of Ketaloamar. And of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shava, which is the king's dale, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the most high God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Well, now he knew that. God made Abraham the father of all the nations. His name was Abram when he came from Ur of the Chaldees, which means father, Abram. But when he called him Abraham, he added the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Daleth, Hey. And when he did that, he added something to Abraham in his name, and it meant high father. And God said to Abraham, in thee shall all nations be blessed. And he said, Abraham, I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. Now here's Melchizedek. He doesn't belong to anybody's church. There was no synagogues. There was no temple. None of that. There's no priesthood. It is Melchizedek who is a priest himself. And it was a very high priesthood. Melchizedek is priest, king. All that left is prophet. And there's only one man in that Bible who was ever a prophet, priest, and king. And you know who he was? He was the king of Israel. His name was David. Prophet, priest, and king. Did you know that after him there was only one man in the Bible that was prophet, priest, and king? Lord Jesus Christ. Prophet, priest, and and king. The prophets died, didn't they? He said, I sent unto you the prophets, and they died, right? So the prophet died at the cross. The Lord Jesus Christ died at the cross. But when he rose from the dead, he rose as the last Adam, second man, as the high priest seated at the right hand of the Father. Now he's priest. When heavens open and roll back like a scroll, he'll come as king of kings and Lord of lords. So important to understand the chronology of how things progress in the Bible. And it's a beautiful thing. The last Adam died for his bride. He died for her. And so if he hadn't died for her, all mankind, God said, I'll make you another bride. We'll just do another one. Just like Moses. God said to Moses, hey, forget them. I'll, make, I'll pick more people. I'll make you the head of more people. And Moses said, if you write their name out of the book, take my name too. 
I like Moses. I like Moses. I do. Moses is, is one of the greatest men that ever lived. He really is, folks. Uh, he, he, he was something else. He was a great man. Moses was. And uh, he's up there with Abraham. He's up there with Job, Daniel. He's up there with all of them. Moses is. So Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7. Look at this carefully with me. The 53rd chapter of Isaiah. If you can get a Jew into the 53rd chapter of Isaiah and get him to admit who it's talking about, you can get him saved. The 53rd chapter of Isaiah is not talking about some servant of mankind. The 53rd chapter of Isaiah is talking about the servant of the Lord that we read about in Isaiah. Isaiah 53, 7 says this, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Now watch this carefully. Who shall declare his generation? Here's a question. Remember, Bullinger said there's 14 of them in the Bible. Now there are more generations in the Bible, but these are 14 separate listings of generations. Who will declare his generation? Well, he wasn't married. Yeah, but he's got a bride. Why does he have a bride? You see, God the Father had a wife. You remember I preached about her Sunday morning. His wife was Ephraim or Israel. That was his wife. He said, I am your husband. And I told you that had to do with the genealogies and the legal right to the possession of the land and to the ruling king. But the relationship of the Lord Jesus Christ with his bride has to do with something that is far, far different. It has to do with a spiritual thing. Spiritual thing. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Nicodemus, you must be born again. It's not Nicodemus, I know you don't appreciate what I'm saying. It's not Nicodemus, I know you're a stinking hypocrite and you just want me to hear me say what you, no, 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 no. He said, Nicodemus, if you had really divided the word of God and understood it the way it's written, you would be looking forward to a time when you would be born again. That's what, he, that's what he rebuked him for. But know carefully now. Who shall declare his generation? See the question mark? Have you got his open to the Bible there? Isaiah 53, 7. For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. See this? There's no question in my mind, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Lord Jesus. Isaiah 53 is about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's all over it, okay? But the question is asked, who shall declare his generation? Why is there a generation? What's that got to do with anything? See? Now look at Isaiah 53 verse 10. In Isaiah 53 verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. The 22nd Psalm, he's being crucified. He's coming back as the chief shepherd, great shepherd, good shepherd, all wound up in one. He will come back for his people. But here's what I want you to see. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he has done this. Now, look at Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18. This is written 700 years before Christ. Okay? That's a long time. If you'd have been alive 2,000 years ago, you're looking at a book that was written 700 years before you were born. Here's what it says. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. All right, now, remember what you just read? Go to Hebrews 2, verse 10.
Now what you get in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews takes these Old Testament passages and he makes application after application after application. That's one of the greatest ways to learn the Bible. In other words, the Bible is interpreting the Bible. There's no, there's no better way than that, folks. Now look at Hebrews 2.10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold I and the children which God hath given me. I'm a child of God. I was born of a spiritual union between the Son of God and his bride. That's what it was for. Nicodemus, you must be born again. It's an impossibility for it to happen until you have a bride of Christ. And we are his bride spiritually now. We're not talking about a physical birth. We're talking about a spiritual birth. Where does it come from? It comes from the one who established the new covenant. And without that new covenant, there is no new birth. Because the new birth is based entirely on the new covenant. What's the new covenant? The blood covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. The covenant was ratified at the cross. In other words, it was brought into power, legality, and being. That's when the New Testament started, folks. It started when Christ died on the cross. And we are his children and his brethren. And I can't explain all that tonight, but I can tell you this. Spiritually, spiritually, he is my elder brother. We are, but I also was begotten of him, begotten of him with the bride of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. There's a union that takes place and a birth that takes place. Now, I'll close with this. He's called the second man, last Adam. Second man means that all the men that lived up into him, up into him, belonged to the first Adam and came under all of the first Adam's problems, curses, everything. First Adam, all right? But the last Adam is the Lord Jesus Christ. And being the last Adam, then therefore all that the first Adam gave you is null and void. Because now under the last Adam, I can receive the blessings of the firstborn because he is the firstborn. We're members of the church of the firstborn. That means we get a double portion of the Holy Spirit. That means that we are priests in our home. That means that we are the beginning of the strength of God. All of these things are so necessary for you to understand because the church is wallowing around in self-pity and they're wallowing around in Old Testament theology and don't have a clue who they really are. Do you realize tonight that if you really mean it and you are really, you really understand the power of the Holy Spirit of God, you can say to a demon, leave. And it's gone. It has to go. And I've had to do that more than once. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the blood covenant of the Son of God, leave. You don't need some exorcist. You don't need some professional. Seven sons of Sceva, you remember them? We adjure thee by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Come out. They came out. <laughs> they came out and beat them up. But I'm afraid a lot of Christians are afraid of stuff like that. They're afraid of it. Some of these churches here in town had some folks come to me, sat in my office up there a few years ago. A few years ago, they sat down and I met with them. They said, Preacher, we've got a spirit in our house and this thing's causing us a lot of trouble and the whole family's upset with it and uh, we don't know how to deal with this thing. I said, well, let me tell you something. You've got to be born again yourself. If you're not born again yourself, you are nothing but you, get out of there. But if you are born again, then you can say to this spirit, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the blood covenant, get out of this house and leave us alone. They said they had gone to their church and to some of the leaders in their church and that they had gotten a kind of a generic answer to their problem about the demons. Well, let's just pray and everything will be okay. 
Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Here's what a lot of people get, folks. I want to be as honest as I can to you tonight. A lot of Christians, when they go to their pastors and their church leaders, they get generic answers because they do not want to get involved in something that most of them don't even believe in. Mo and I'm talking about fundamental Baptist churches in this country do not believe that such a thing as a spirit being, a demon, can really cause you problems and can, and can, and can possess certain people that don't believe it. They don't believe it. And so therefore, if you happen to be in a church like that and you can't get any, can't get any help, you'll probably stand a much better chance of getting help in a church like that from another Christian in there that's been through this kind of thing because they'll know how to deal with, uh, with what's going on. And so I asked them later, I said, how's it going? I said, we got peace. We got peace. We got peace. I said, thank the good Lord. We got peace. I've had people call me, write me. You wouldn't believe how many, how many letters I get and how much emails I get. And I'll get more for what I said tonight because they're looking for somebody that'll tell them you're not crazy. <laughs> that demons exist. And but some people, are, they're, they're obsessed with it. That's all. I mean, it's a demon casting out service every time they meet. You know that. I'm not an exorcist. I'm a pastor. But on occasion, we have to deal with one. And when we have to deal with it, we deal with it. Amen. And demons come in all kinds of flavors, religious demons, filthy demons, vile demons. Oh my, my. This one man, this one demon left came back with seven more worse than himself. That's what we're dealing with tonight. Aren't you glad for the Bible and the Holy Ghost? Born of the Spirit of God. Amen. Born of the Holy Ghost. I've seen too many of my brethren blow their brains out, hang themselves, suicides, because they listen to people instead of God. Amen. If that thing comes after you, confront it face on in the name of Jesus. They're smart, they're intelligent beings, and they're, they're like electricity. They take the path of least resistance. <laughs> so they'll go somewhere else. Father, bless your word tonight. Bless your word and bless the dear folk who've listened. This was for somebody because I hadn't planned on saying anything about a demon. So it was for somebody. There's somebody that heard this tonight that this is going to help. It's going to help them. They've, been at the, they've, been, they've suffered through this for a long time and this will help them. And if you're listening to me tonight and you're the one, I encourage you in the name of Jesus to know for certain you're born again. And if you are born of the Spirit of God, you have authority over any evil spirit that exists through the blood covenant in the name of the Lord Jesus. In thy holy name I pray, amen. Amen.